let's call this meeting to order. Uh, today is the third, and this is the Finance Committee. Okay, and we will be going over the budget. And let's see who we have first. I'm looking so for no, page number. Oh, so you're going to page um, 80. Thank you. Okay, so um, Linda, I, I'm guessing you're going to be speaking to a lot of these. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yep, yep. John and I are both here to go through, uh, sort of go back and forth, and David handles some of them too. Do you want us to come up again? or? Yeah, that would yeah, yeah, be great. Right. We'll make one more chance for John. Most of the 800s, yeah. and you're doing the 800s. We're going to start with 800. Okay. You want to start with 700? Sure. 700 is the debt and interest that we okay. pay each year. We have um, a single line item gets voted in for principal, mm -hmm. and then a single line item for the interest. Both the principal and interest are made up of uh, the debt exclusion amount that we pay and also the amount of debt that we pay um, directly, uh, we call it within the levy, which is uh, it's it, as a part of the budget, so it's paid through uh, tax dollars and it's not subject to override. Most of our debt is uh, subject to debt exclusion override. And that once that's been passed, it, it, it gets borrowed. But we a certain amount of debt also we borrow, and it's paid through the budget through mm -hmm. uh, general fund. A good example of that, um, and the reason why we do that at the same time, is the purchase of the land in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, when, you, when the town goes to go ahead and borrow and pay it back, with not subject to override, that means that um, uh, we don't have to then wait six, eight weeks for a um, ballot election. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, it's speedier and also um, just, a, that's the main thing, isn't it? It's, it's quicker and it also just settles something right on the spot so that the town can move forward. So that's the last one that we did was purchase of the land. So that, that is a portion of that. Um, the amount that we had uh, that we borrowed for last year, principal and interest, uh, these aren't the borrowings, these are the amounts, obviously, that we pay back. And we do have, um, uh, we, by the time that we do the budget now, it's before we've done our borrowing in June. So that's the reason why we can't say at this point how much is going to be principal and how much is interest. But the two of them together is going to be a, a, a steady amount. So we know how much we're going to be paying back in debt and interest in the next fiscal year because that's been determined by uh, the loan payments and the amount that we said that we were going to limit the um, debt payments, the amount that we have told the town, this is the amount we're paying each year to keep within that $95 um, a year impact on the average household. So that the total amount can be determined. But then when we do the borrowing, um, the allocation between the interest and the debt and the interest and the principal will shift and we'll probably will fix that probably at the fall town meeting now this last year at the fall town meeting we did not um, we did not make that adjustment if I didn't think of it actually because we were doing so much else with changing the budget and we we did change the those line items but that was to reduce it by 10,000 so you'd have the money to spend elsewhere in the budget so we are actually going back to town meeting um, at our annual town meeting, we will be shifting this year's debt payments uh, so that we have more. Fortunately, it's in a good direction. We're putting 30000 more out of interest that we'd um, estimated into the principal line item, which is good. That means we paid another 30000 down on, on the debt. Mm -hmm. So that's how it works. Um, this last year, um, what David is in there for S FY18 voted is actually the amount that we're going to be asking to come back into it. We voted uh, um, 
that's the that's the new and improved figure that we're going to be asking okay. for at town meeting. And then for fiscal 19 request, um, my my numbers are slightly different. My total is one two sixty seven eight twenty six. Um, I will get that. Ex I mean that that could be a good figure at this point. Um, it's it's shifting a little bit because we're looking at potentially doing a little extra borrowing to for us the school HVAC was under um, was underestimated and we may be going back to town meeting to ask for that to be increased and that again would be an example of something the project is underway we need the money that's probably going to be something that we do within the levy um, and. Um, there will at the very least be an interest payment so I need a little I need a little wiggle room there but mm -hmm. uh, we'll get these figures together and by the time you put this in the budget um, hopefully we'll have some good figures to put in there but the total will be about what you see there mm -hmm. um, I see we put in for one million two hundred seventy thousand six eighty mm -hmm. my latest calculation with this extra uh, with the HVAC is one million two sixty seven eight twenty six so mm -hmm. um, that hopefully is uh, explains how we got those figures. Any question on <coughs> debt and interest? Okay. <laughs> Should we move on to the nines now? Or you do you want to do the eights? Go on to the nines because there's not much to say about the eights. Okay. <clears throat> okay. The 900s. These are the uh, mostly, uh, these are benefits. Uh, the first one uh, retirement. Every budget should be as easy as this one. We receive a letter in December and it says the amount that you owe, this is the Hampshire County Retirement System, and they tell us with our own calculations, I think, how much it is that uh, is Hadley's portion of uh, the payment into the system for the coming fiscal year. Um, <coughs> you'll see that requested amount, and I'll tell you how we do this, uh, the amount that they give us is one million one twenty four nine ninety nine, mm -hmm. and uh, we have an option of paying it in two installments. Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, in, in two. Uh, yes, those that in, it can be paid in two installments, or we can pay the whole thing on July one, and that would be one million one hundred and five thousand oh twenty two, which is almost twenty thousand dollars less. And since we do our big borrowing right there in June for the year, we'll have the cash on hand. We should be able to do that. Um, uh, each, it, you know, it used to be a little bit easier just to say, why don't you leave us that full amount in case we don't have all the money at that point and we just don't have that flexibility in the budget anymore. So we say, we're gonna do it. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna pay that full amount on Ju July 1 so that we can mm -hmm. use that lesser figure. Mm -hmm. And that is everything we have to say about retirement. Okay. Uh, workers' comp. Um, David, we have something we want to say about conversation that. Conversation that Joan and I have uh, in January as to where we think the workers' compensation claims are going to go. We look at the, uh, the potential that's still out there, and we make a, an estimate as to what we may accrue in the next 18 months. So this is an estimate. Is at best, based okay. upon historical averages and what was uh, what's potentially out there. What's potentially out there is not necessarily going to result in a claim, but it might. So we should budget for that. How did that work? So if you know, somebody gets hurt, we have insurance, and insurance pays them or no? Is that how that works? Or other workers' comp. Actually, your your explanation works more towards unemployment, much better than this one. But the workers' comp, it's based on the wages. <laughs> but we don't always know oh, what those are going to be when we're, when we're giving the estimate for the workers' comp. They then come and do an audit after the fact too, which may either result in additional charges or, on the lovely rare occasion, we get a refund. Okay. All right. So that that yeah that's the premium that we just the don't premium, know what they're right. going to be. Okay. Right. Right. And then the unemployment, yeah. we kind of try, right. to, we try to kind of figure out what claims are out there. We go through and we know we're going to have claims at a certain point, or people will be eligible to, to make a claim, say if they're in a uh, long-term sub-position, or it's just a temporary position, so we know they would be eligible to file 
and get. So we kind of estimate what those potential claims are, look at what we have outstanding for active claims. Um, and we've actually gone a little, about 10,000 under only because the last few years have shown us that while there's that potential, most people try to get a job right away, so you don't end up getting hit with that. So we think we're pretty comfortable with that 30,000 right there. Right. We did. Um, we have 40,000 was budgeted for fiscal 18. That's because we actually spent $40,000 in fiscal 17, and the year before we'd only spent five. That's compo we really just don't know what claims are going to be be in, and uh, there's a limited ability to control it. There's some. There's some, but I mean, it's not like that's not one of those magical. If you get the right HR person, there's always going to be unemployment claims. There's always good reasons that people leave. The reason it's different for us is we're a reimbursable unit. We don't pay into the system mm -hmm. on, on a regular basis by employee. We pay as the claims come in. So mm -hmm. we, and we, by doing that, we've saved well over $100,000 in the past mm -hmm. nine, ten years mm -hmm. by having it that way. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. while we might get hit one year with some higher claims, when we level it out, it's, been, it's worked well for us. Okay. okay. So far this year, we have spent about 10000 The first half of the year, we spent none. And all of a sudden, in three months, we have $10,000. Um, we, we think our estimate for the rest of this year will, could be uh, about 20000 because now we know what claims have, are out there and have been approved. Mm -hmm. um, that'll be, so that'll be 20000 The balance of that 20000 will go back in. Um, uh, if, if you're looking at your budget book and it said you spent, said you spent forty thousand the year before, I want to explain that. In fiscal seventeen, we budgeted fourteen thousand for it, but for a while we were carrying a uh, we carry um, we carry a money separately in a in a trust account, sort of to, to even that out from time to time. So we've had uh, we had over twenty five thousand dollars in that account. So when our fourteen was depleted, we went and almost spent all the twenty five, which is why we had to raise it to 40 for this year and now we're not going to use it um, so I think David's uh, we, we talked an estimate of being 30,000 is probably that's a good estimate um, but I would put a pitch in at this time too and talking about something like that where we have a, a swing um, and you probably with your with your you know with your budget dollars don't want to just put extra in there if we need it that I would say that's uh, when you talk about your own reserve fund, mm -hmm. the more you cut down funds like this, I hope that you will keep, but you will not also be cutting down your reserve fund because that's where we would be looking to if right. we come short. I know we're not the only budget in that position. So as you're asking us to keep the requests down in case you don't need it, we then would probably be needing to look to your reserve fund all the more. So. Please don't cut that one down. Mm -hmm. And just, just to drive the point home, you've got a $19 million budget and your cushion is $50,000. So if you think about it in terms of percentages, it's we have to run things very, very tightly in order to uh, stay within your reserve fund. Right. Is that so that, well, you mentioned there was a trust, so that's gone? We depleted it, and we have not put. I think we have maybe eleven hundred or fourteen hundred something in there uh, dollars left in it. It it was initially funded by an article, wasn't it? Yeah, it used to be that in the in the good old days so that the um, the, the what was it? the unemployment insurance was not even in the budget, but we raised money and put it into an article. Once every five years, we'd replenish that money. The danger with that is that, uh, that as you went down to closer to zero, uh, you could not afford any kind of overrun in that article because you can't transfer money from the reserve fund in, into it without a town meeting vote. So it was, it was a risky way of managing this particular budget. So we gently moved from reliance upon the trust fund to placing a line item within the budget so that we would have more options in case there was a uh, un uh, unemployment insurance overrun or overdraft. And we've been paying down that trust fund and not replenishing it and beefing up this particular line item as you can see from the history. Because um, yeah. another option we would have if we were going to have extra 20000 is to take that 20000 and put it into the trust fund. But that's out of free cash and that's money you don't have for something else. So mm -hmm. it's you know, mm -hmm. we're, 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 
there's a lot to balance there, but that is an option that we have on the, then when it's, it's sitting there and then you don't have to have so much in the line item budget, it would stay there until it's used up and then we would only come back for more money when we needed more, when we needed to replenish that. So for now, uh, this is working, this will get us through this year, but it is something to think about as we go forward. Do we want to plan that a little bit better? Okay. Um, all right, anything else on that? Um, the um, health insurance is 914. And this is the uh, this is the one that we've paid the most attention to and has gotten a lot of attention, uh, and we've gotten information out to employees. We have uh, taken the step of you know we have looked at, at the options that we are offering for health insurance and um, and evaluated them both in terms of what it costs and whether it is really something that we need to be offering because of our other offerings. We looked at the, um, the general, the Network Blue Health Plan that we have, which is, they don't call themselves an HMO, but it virtually is an HMO, but the trouble with HMO is people think that this means you just go to one doctor and you're, you know, this is it and you, everything is very tightly controlled. It really isn't. It's part of the Blue Cross Blue Shield system, but it is limited to uh, New England states. I think there's eight, eight, about eight New England states. It's a large area from Maine to New York to um, Massachusetts, Connecticut, um, New Hampshire, really some of the best health care in the country is in our area. It's a, it's a great um, it's a great area for medical um, care. And then we had the other program, which is the Blue Care Elect, which is uh, uh, more of, uh, it's a PPO. It means they can choose from the larger area. They're not restricted to the New England area. They can get the, they can use doctors outside of the area. Um, on, um, on discussions of it and why people are using the Blue Care Elect as opposed to the Network Blue, again, we get back to those concerns that I was talking about. People have a, something in mind of what a, an HMO is and finding it limiting. Um, I can personally say from having a, a, a family of five and been on this plan a long time that is way more than adequate. It, is, it has served everything that we need. We know employees in town that have had very serious surges, surgeries, been flown places, have had um, issues, health, um, all kinds of concerns, and not had an issue with that at all. Um, there is a, there are, others have raised concern that we want to have the option of going to the doctor that we want. That's a little, that, that, there is some truth to that, but it's also, this is the blue care system. You still need to have a qualified doctor within the blue care. Blue, uh, Blue Cross system. Um, so it's not completely open in that way. It's geographic is really the only restriction. So um, a, doctor, a doctor would have to be approved uh, through Blue Cross even if you were outside of the area. So it's not completely open. We were very comfortable and now the money side of it is that it is a much more expensive plan the, uh, the PPO, the Blue Care Elect, was a much more expensive plan for the individual and for the town, because the town pays 65% of either of those plans. And um, we feel like this, if when we looked at it, and Joan did some you know, calculation sheets on what people are on now and what they would be having, uh, what it would cost if they were to move to the Network Blue Care, uh, Network Blue Plan instead, there was, um, there's about forty thousand dollars in savings there to the town. There is close to that much in savings for the employees also. So we feel like this is this if is they something. Go to the PPO one or the no. HMO one? If they go to the HMO, okay. Mm -hmm. um, we will have situations, however, um, we don't. We want to have everyone in the HMO, but there will be situations where we will have employees or retirees who really the only option for them would be the Blue Care Elect. If they're living out of state, out of New England, 
or um, perhaps if there's a if they have a dependent who is going to school out of state and would need that coverage if there's no other option. So it, it's not that it wouldn't be available to us as as we're still part of the trust, mm -hmm. but it would only be available to the employees as an only option if the if the network need is not the option. I think that's in those right. I don't have that option at work. You get there's your insurance and that's it. Yeah, right. There's not a whole lot to choose from. And going forward it yes, you know, that, 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 yeah, that would that would be it going yeah. forward. And um, I, I think that it is it was a it's jarring for some to hear and realize I have to make a change and we, we did tell people, some that called um, she said, we, well, that they were concerned they would have to change doctors. I said, well, call your doctor, find out is that true. You, right. Maybe you just think, maybe the, you, you get have that impression or you're worried about it because long ago when you were on an HMO, we, were, we looked at an HMO once and it was very, and we were in one once, and it was very confining 25 years ago. Sure. <laughs> but this, mm -hmm. is, this is different. Mm -hmm. And I think it's worth a look and I think that people are going to be hap very happy with it. And um, well, Joan's been here longer and you said we've never really had a complaint with anyone about the care they have gotten. It's no, just not an issue. We have had some major, I mean, there's always going to be one or two things that come up. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, it's been very good and people have been very happy with it. And some major issues and they were amazed at how well it was covered and they were taken care of. However, I believe this has to be the decision the select board would have to make. Mm -hmm. we, yeah. Yeah. Um, but we budgeted with that in mind. Also, oh, the number that you right. have so is with, is without, yes. without having the blue care left. So okay. Joan calculated, so yeah, Joan calculated what it would if we stayed with the plans that were offered now going into the next year, uh -huh. we would be uh, our total budget would increase from one million two hundred sixty-seven thousand to one million two hundred eighty-two thousand. Uh -huh. Then, if you take those individuals, not only is it just switching them over to the other plan, but there are people under the um, the Blue Care Elect that are in a family plan. Mm -hmm. They're a couple, but they're in a family plan because that it does not have a two tier option. Two tier would be yourself and another adult uh, in your family, but the Blue Care uh, Network Blue does have the two tier option. So there are people that are not only going to have the savings in doing a family plan. From blue, from uh, blue care elect to network blue, but then they're also going to drop down to the two tier. They're going to they're going to experience, and as are we, both sides will experience great savings. Mm -hmm. We were concerned at first, and we we certainly were. And um, I, I have to say honestly, I was not aware of some of the issues that involve retirees. If when they retire before um, they're 65 um, and leave the area, that they would not be able to take the uh, that take the network blue insurance with them. Uh, we did speak with the Hampshire County Retirement System and it is allowable. Well, first of all, they say we do not have to offer the upper, the blue care elect, but it's also possible if you do off offer only the network blue that you could carve out an exception for those retirees that you would continue to cover them at the other level. And, and the other, uh, Joan mentioned that you know, having an out of state dependent too, that there are situations that we we can sit down and do our bullet points and carve out our exceptions and we would bring that to the select board and say we want to vote to only offer this plan with the exception that. And we know that there is uh, there are certainly many, um, uh, many employees who are watching that carefully and want to make sure that we get that exception in because it's not our intention to, to yank out valuable health care. But we think this is a really a win-win all around, and uh, I think we announced it early enough so that we could elicit info responses and and help people. I said, well, you know, call call your doctor, find out the situation, and if this isn't as we represent it, give us a call back. And I have not heard call backs from from those uh, about those concerns. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so so yeah, the drop then from one million to eighty two thousand by moving everyone to the mm -hmm. network blue, uh, one million two hundred forty one thousand, which is the amount that's in. Um, that I guess David was so confident in in our, in our figures and the votes that he he gave us. He cut it right down. But I, I think that it's this is all subject to it passing through, and we we have one unknown though, and I guess it would have to probably be addressed at fall town meeting is. Um, the trust is moving our plan year from April 1, which was April 1 to March 30th, 
-hmm. And we had an open enrollment in February this year for that plan year. However, they are now going to be moving all of the Hampshire units to a July 1 start date, as the Franklin units are. So we will have another open enrollment in um, first week in May, I believe. I, I go to a meeting uh, next week to find out about it. Mm -hmm. So we may see more people coming on board. I don't know. We did see an increase with this last open enrollment, and it, it's an unknown. I, I have no way of predicting that. So, But that, I think we would have to probably absorb a fall town meeting then if there's mm -hmm. additional. Yeah, actually going from, <clears throat> it used to be with the health care year from April to March, and the fiscal year going from July to June, there was always that end quarter of the uh, fiscal year where we didn't know what the rates would be, and so that spurred us to pet on budget for more risk or more unknowns in this budget. So. A I think this now. Yeah, it'll, yeah. Be, it'll, it'll actually help things right. out. So that's our health budget. Yeah. I have a question. So I, I, I know that the, um, I see where you get the 40000 that's the savings you just talked about. Mm -hmm. And I know that I'm um, guessing health care also goes up every year. Now I know we, didn't we just save uh, uh, some money too on, um, there was a handful of employees that, you talk about new employees coming on, but there was also mm -hmm. a handful of employees that, came off, correct? Mm -hmm. And is that just a, like, maybe, so maybe so many came on and the ones that went off, it's yeah. just an offset? Because it almost did, because I ended up, when we redid the numbers, <laughs> when I redid them today, they came out almost to exactly. the same, exactly, okay. to the, yeah. to the uh, 1241. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How could it be the same? I look back and that was it. We ended up with this, with folks coming on, but we also had uh, retirees that I'm calculating in here already, mm -hmm. so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, weren't they already? Like the yeah, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah. Of. Yeah. There was a handful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And we were also looking to that. Uh, that savings would offset um, additional staff of the, or firefighters that you. Right. So that was going to wash through too. That's mm -hmm. not going to really ever end up in additional savings. Right. Um, so much as a uh, as an offset. But we were probably would have been up much higher if we. Okay. So. Um, I mean, if, if, if some didn't drop mm -hmm. off. So I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> All right. Now, as far as the, the life insurance, mm -hmm. that is a, uh, it's a minimal policy, 2000 policy. They either elect it when they're hired, and that's the only opportunity for it. So we don't see a lot of fluctuation in that, and it's so small. The town does pay 50% of that um, policy, so the 2800 is pretty round amount based on what we have now and maybe adding in a few new ones for the fall I estimate and then a few going to retirement in June so that's a pretty simple one. The Medicare that um, that fluctuates. <laughs> you wouldn't I mean you can see where it goes up and down and what I base it on is a 7% increase to um, prior years salaries seven percent seven percent you would think there would be four or five but you also have and there's getting to be fewer of them but as people retire who were hired before 1986 they're not subject to Medicare so we didn't have to pay a share mm -hmm. and once we're replacing them with people those people are subject to the Medicare so we'll always see a little more of an increase until that those folks are flushed out um, which we're in no hurry for we like, we like having folks around who know what they're doing um, Though, for the time being, then, so you can't say, okay, there's going to be a 4% salary increase, which isn't always the same, whatever it is, mm -hmm. wherever it is across the board, it's not always 1%, 2%. But historically, we found that that 7% range kind of fits mm -hmm. on it. So that's what we've put in there for this year. Okay. Also, you also have raised the issue that not all salaries are in the budget, that the, when this people are hired under grants or another way, that we're still paying the Medicare on those and we can't always get our hands on what that figure is <laughs> yeah. ahead of time. And OPEB. OPEB's the last one in the 900. Mm -hmm. This is where we're marching along on, uh, on our plan to continue to fund this. 
um, with the um, we started at a point a few years ago uh, backing off of the more aggressive uh, plan and just say, let's just have it march along the same way the rest of the budget did at 2.5% a year because we know we can uh, probably absorb that with um, the, the, be the most palatable way to do that. And I'll tell you, over time, that makes a difference. We're coming up. We're going to have over a million dollars in that this year. We still have a long way to go. We need, um, but we are making a, a, a huge dent in it. And if we continue along, um, that's just what we need to do. Um, we had a new way of evaluating when we had our OPEB valuation. There was, you know, the new Gatsby, and things are changed. And so, whenever they make changes in how they do the valuation, it becomes more and more difficult to compare it to the year before because oh, that was under the old rules, now the new rules. But we did find a way, and we had a nice talk with our uh, OPEB, uh, our actuary, about how you know what what are our signs, what how can we really look for this because. Uh, from year to year, last year our total liability increased from 6.9 to 7.8 million dollars. That was a, he says that's mostly an actuarial adjustment. And our unfunded portion of it, as as what's still left that we have to fund, because that was a total figure I gave you. But our net, what we still have to fund, went from 6.4 million to 6.9 million. And again, that's an increase. But he said the one to look, the one to look at then is the ratio, the funded ratio between the two. We went from 8% funded to 11% funded between the two years. And uh, that's still 89% unfunded, but we are going the right direction as in we're keeping up with it. Because if you do not make those contributions, it's not like we would be staying at the 8%, we'd actually start going down. So we're, we're keeping up with it at this point, and over time, uh, we'll make that difference if we ever had a a windfall or you know something that came our way and said, what do we do with this money? I'll tell you, OPEB is probably the best investment. I would then make a case for saying, no, don't put it into stabilization. That is what we used to do, and that was a good plan. But at this point, because of the way we're able to invest the OPEB funds, we actually get that it is our best investment. Um, that seems to you know it does it does. There are months where it goes down, and this last this last couple of months have been difficult in every investment account. But overall, as we look at the big picture, uh, it is uh, doing, uh, it is able to <coughs> increase at a better rate than the stabilization. There are different rules that um, control your, your investment, that provide the investment guidelines to municipalities for each kind, of, um, each kind of a fund. And we're doing very well with the OPEP fund. And, um, and we don't even have that in the highest risk. We, we are, we're not conservative, but we're not the aggressive. We, we chose our sort of, you know, our, our Hadley middle of the road, <laughs> exactly the, the, the middle level. Uh, they, each time we meet with them, they try, they encourage us to, to get a little bit riskier. Um, this last meeting a couple weeks ago, this particular climate right now does not feel like the, the one to get risky in. <laughs> so we're very happy that we chose the, the way that we did. We had a little slippage over the last few months, but I'll tell you on balance, <coughs> from year to year, um, we're doing pretty well with that fund. If you look on page 23, there's a little chart that shows exactly what Linda was talking about, of, uh, having, or gaining ground. So you know, the good news is that we've stopped the bleeding, and we're actually making uh, gaining ground on the unfunded liabilities. So uh, we're in much better shape with respect to OPEB than many, many, many other towns in the Commonwealth. Great. <coughs> so I did have a question on OPEB. I'm wondering how the funds are actually managed and what the administrative costs are. And I'm bringing it up because I don't know if any of you got to read the um, new program for the HCG, where they're taking, basically, they're approaching smaller communities and saying, if you want to invest anything in OPEB, we manage on aggregate the funds through a part that they use so mm -hmm. that they can keep administrative costs low for people that might not be investing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't know if there's a potential cost savings for us there by going into the essentially the regional approach to it. Right. Um, well, we have a group approach in that Bartholomew, which is where we invest these funds, specifically has a program. They have a very large government municipal division and uh, doing OPEB funding is one of their large carved out areas and current and so they so we're in with a group in that way um, 
I would certainly look at anything. I mean, that's really our obligation if there's something that comes along. I have a feeling, and I may be wrong, I have a feeling that's like, you haven't gotten started yet, let's get started, let will help you out. So encouraging them to get in and, and you know, get some, get some um, progress here because there are a number of towns that just go, we, we can't afford, they look at a $6.9 million liability. We can't, we can't touch that. Well, you know, we're not even gonna, they're not even going to try, or they've got other issues. Um, they did it. It's a habit, you know, just like anything else that you do. It's a habit that we now have, and it's a good habit because we don't have anywhere else we get that money. But um, I was aware of that too. Um, we have um, when we look from month to month about how much uh, how much the fund has gone up or down. It includes. The, the administrative costs are in there. So if we have gained $2,000, that's net of administrative costs. If we lose $3,000, some of that is administrative costs in that. So we certainly have that figure each month that we can isolate and, and see. And I would look at other, I would look at other plans just to make sure that we're doing well. But um, we've been very happy with Bartholomew and um, uh, it was set up before I got here, and I'm very glad it was, and I think um, it's uh, it's one that we want to continue with at this time. But yes, always listening. Yeah, maybe worth a quick peek. Always. Absolutely. I think that's it for the 900s. 920. Uh -oh. Civilization? Uh -oh. Because, uh, I think that's yours. Shoot. Yeah, so... Um, our stabilization account is somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, $2.1 million. If you look at it as a percentage of the overall budget, we're above our recommended target of 10% or $2 million as a, as a total dollar figure. Um, but the graph is showing a clear decline uh, as our budget expands and as stabilization remains relatively at the same 2.1 number. Um, the percentage of stabilization funds available for expenditure <coughs> in uh, emergencies is declining uh, of relative to the overall budget. So I <coughs> suggested it this last year and they didn't, nobody liked it and I'm sure nobody likes it this year either that we start transferring from free cash into stabilization and this would be the first uh, small installment of five thousand dollars into the stabilization account. So to keep the figure proportionately where it's at now, how much would we actually need every year? Something a lot more than five thousand dollars right now. I would have to calculate it. I haven't done that math. Okay. I'm not against making some headway on like keeping it there so it doesn't dip below the recommended amount. I'm just mm -hmm. wondering in a year where we're proposing pulling from stabilization for the stabilization to the school, essentially, mm -hmm. the project, does it make sense to also then be putting back into it? Basically, yeah. is it confusing the voters, or does it look a bit odd? Mm -hmm. so, we can discuss with the select board. So the 800 series budgets are the state assessments and other unappropriated expenses, and this starts on page 88. Or 89. So for the most part, this consists of charges from the state that we see on the cherry sheet. Uh, we see school choice assessment, charter school assessment, motor vehicle assessment, air pollution assessment, and PVTA assessment. These all appear on that second sheet of the cherry sheet. This was the numbers that are here were the ones that were released by the governor. Um, in particular, looking at the choice, school choice and the charter school assessments, uh, Annie can't tie these, Annie the superintendent cannot tie these back to any kind of real numbers and so we're thinking that th these are estimates that the governor made or his administration made uh, thinking that 
charter of choice could always go up, and we have a request from the Chinese charter, language charter school to uh, increase their enrollment by 60 percent. Um, that was recently denied. So we're thinking, and there's some work that Annie and I are doing behind the scenes, we're thinking that those increases are not going to be quite as high, that there may be actually a lot less uh, charter and school choice assessments uh, levied in the next round of budgeting through the House. And I expect those budgets to come out on April 17th and 18th, so we may have a lot of room here. Uh, but otherwise, these numbers are rip and read right off the cherry sheet. As you see, the, those increased from one year to the next by $146,000. That's a, went a long way towards pushing our total local aid into negative numbers. Mm -hmm. So anything we can do to control those costs and work with better projections out of the uh, state would be good. Um, offsets. School choice offset, library offset, again, these are numbers that appear on the front page of the cherry sheet. These come from the governor's budget proposal. It's rip and read. $554,000 for school choice. That's offset and goes directly to school for their expenditure. And then the library offset of $6,905, that goes directly to the library for them to spend as according to their mission. Uh, the, only ch the only number here that we actually control is the overlay. And we have a figure there of $70,000, which is a $40,000 increase. Overlay is for any challenges to a, a tax bill, uh, if there's a successful challenge to that tax bill, then the levy is made up by the transfer out of overlay. Um, <clears throat> it was $30,000 in FY18 because we took advantage of the changes in the rules by which the overlay is managed. The Municipal Modernization Act allowed us to blend fiscal year overlays uh, into one bucket, whereas formerly you had to draw a, an appeal of one tax year you had to draw from that year's overlay, like a parfait, if you will. So if I went back and I challenged something from, say, four years ago, I would have to draw, and I won, then the money would be drawn from that four-year-ago uh, overlay account. Uh, but now it's blended. We don't have to manage it quite that well. Um, so. I put it back up to $70,000 on the advice of the assessors. We'll take another look at that when we uh, go into the fall town meeting. <clears throat> That's all I have for you up right there. That's okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. I rescheduled council meeting to meet with you tonight. They have a few more to go to, so I've got them on for Monday. Okay. And Monday is your meeting where you're working with the, uh, the warrants and uh, any cleanup uh, that we have to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be here tomorrow. We'll be tomorrow. Right. I'm, I'm coming back on Tuesday, so uh, okay. I'm going to miss those two. Right. Yeah. Let's see. So, Monday. Okay. So that we have a scheduled yeah. meeting on Monday, and you said that's when we're going to do it, but you're not going to be there? Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll have to see, and, and you'll be there, correct? Should be, yeah. And so we'll have to, we'll have to double check to make sure. Yep. When do we meet Kathy? You've met Kathy before. I have? Yeah, she was at Park and Rec. She ran the Park and Rec. She's been in a lot of events 
here? I, I bet she have. Saturka. <coughs> so she, I mean, she presented the Saturka part. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I'll probably recognize them as you. Great. Um, so you said, okay, so, and, and I thought it might even come early because of the capital plan. Yep. Is that five here? Is that five here? We'll blend, blend the two meetings together probably. Okay. Six o'clock. Uh, there are only four capital requests. One's, one's probably not ready for prime time. That's the additional funding for the fire substation. Mm -hmm. There's the overrun or the projected shortfall on the school HVAC. Uh, that's How much is that? One hundred ninety, one hundred seventy thousand dollars. Do they know why it was so amazing? They've gone out to bid twice, and they they just got prices higher than they expected. So, and then there's a five thousand uh, dollar web redesign request and a twelve thousand dollar school zone uh, light uh, request. One of the lights have fall it's fallen over. Hmm. Page, the the, um, the schools, which one is it? Is it Hopkins or is it elementary? Elementary. It's the elementary school. Yeah, and Chris Desjardins will be here to present the information. Does that have anything to do with the air conditioning units? That's, that's so there is no there is no air conditioning. No. So they want to put air conditioning in. Okay, so that's all. So that four hundred thousand that we approved for the air conditioning, that's what's short. Right. That's five seventy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, so, uh, tri board is Wednesday. Tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Tomorrow. Okay. I, I won't be at that one. The two of you will? Mm -hmm. You won't be here? Okay, will you, will you be going? I might. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Trying to figure that out, actually. Um, so, um, yeah, unfortunately, you may have a slim finance committee that day. But um, we'll try right. to catch up. All right, good. <laughs> and I guess, do we have anything else? We can take a short meeting then. Absolutely. All right. Then, if everyone's in favor, meeting adjourned. I'm in favor. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right. Bye bye.